Shalom, shalom, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Pulse of Israel here in our eternal and ancestral homeland, the land of Israel, in our eternal and undivided capital, Jerusalem, since King David's time. Okay, here we go. Today we are in for a special treat. We are speaking with Lynn Julius, who I'm going to introduce in, in just a moment. Lynn is the author of a book called Uprooted, uh, about the 3,000 year history of the Jewish people and how it came to an end. Uh, and uh, this is in uh, conjunction with the 80th anniversary of Farhud Day. For those who are not familiar, Farhud was a horrendous pogrom in Iraq um, against the Jewish community by their Arab Muslim neighbors who just minutes earlier, days earlier, they lived peacefully in coexistence. So uh, it, it is very timely to be able to be speaking with Lynn, whose uh, mother is a survivor of that pogrom, and we'll get the details from her and her and her family story. Um, because today, many Israelis, many Jews around the world woke up and saw, saw the pogroms we were experiencing here in Israel, not masses of people being killed, but a lot of violence and lynchings and synagogues being destroyed by neighbors uh, against their uh, Arab Muslim neighbors here in Israel, Israeli citizens against their their um, Jewish neighbors, not understanding what's going on. Where, where does this come from? It makes no sense according to our understanding of reality, coexistence, etc. So we're going to be speaking to Lynn and hearing more about the historical context to maybe get a better understanding of what how we should be viewing things today. <laughs> Folks, as you know, social media censorship is growing. The best way to support our video work for Israel is to subscribe to our video newsletter on pulseofisrael.com and to share our videos. If you are already a subscriber, then thank you. Two additional ways to connect with and support Israel, they are so simple. One, click on this link to help us strengthen Israel by strengthening Judea and Samaria. It's simple, everybody. Just click on the website and choose the best option that works for you to strengthen Judea and Samaria. And number two, enjoy the beauty of Israel whenever you want. No matter where you are in the world, you can enjoy our online virtual tours of Israel. Just visit israelisbeautiful.com and choose the virtual video and activity package that works for you. So here we go. Let us bring in Lynn Julius. Shalom, shalom, Lynn. How are you today? Hello. Very well. Greetings from London where it is not a very nice day, but that's uh, what you expect when you live in London. <laughs> well, welcome. Thank you so much uh, for joining us. And um, I guess a great way to start would, why don't you share with us your, your family story? Because you are personally connected to the story of Iraqi jury and, and the pogrom, the Farhud in 1941. Um, and then from there, we'll go into into your book and why you even wrote a book about this whole uh, Jew Jewish people in the Arab world. Okay, well, thank you very much for inviting me, Avi. Um, yes, we are coming up to the uh, 80th anniversary of the Farhud, which is an Arabic or Kurdish word, which means violent dispossession. Uh, it occurred during two days in June 1941. It was actually the holiday of Shavuot. Uh, 179 identified Jews were murdered. There was terrible looting. Uh, there was rape. There was mutilation. It was absolutely ghastly. Um, and it shocked the Jewish community to such an extent that within 10 years of this happening, they were gone. And 90% of the Jews of Iraq, and there were about 150,000 of them, decided to flee to Israel when given the opportunity in 1950. Now, my family uh, were in a minority of Jews who did not go to Israel. Uh, because my father had studied uh, at a British university during World War II, he had connections in Britain, and so my family ended up in Britain. Uh, but 
my mother actually lived through the Farhood. She was a teenager at the time. Um, the Farhood itself affected the Jews in the old Jewish quarter, which was on the right bank of the River Tigris, uh, mainly. And my mother was in a, a sort of more modern suburb on the on the other side of the river, but she could hear the uh the the gunshots and the mob shrieking uh and the family uh, decided to move to their cousin's house which was two doors down my my mother has uh had had uh three sisters so there were four girls there and they were there was a great fear of rape obviously uh, so they moved to the cousin. The cousin had a revolver and he said, if anything happens, I'm going to shoot my cousins. In other words, um, you know, it, it was more... For them not to be raped. For them not to be raped, exactly. Because uh, I guess he, he understood if a mob comes, he couldn't stop the mob, but at least he yes. could stop the suffering of the... Exactly. Wow. So wow. while they were Horrible. there, my... Um, they, they, they came without shoes, actually, because they, they left in such a rush. And my mother was sent back to the house to get the shoes. And, uh, and while she was there, there was a, a, a loud banging at the door. And it was a, an ashen-faced man. He was actually a cook, a Jewish cook, who worked for my mother's aunt. And he said, please let me in, let me in. And he told the story that he'd been on a bus um, and the mob was pulling all the Jews out of the bus. And uh, they said to him, are you a Jew? And he said, no, I'm a Christian. And actually he was very fair and he didn't look Jewish. And he managed to get away and he ran all the way back to uh, my mother's house. And so that's, that's really her story. Uh, another story I can tell you concerns my aunt, who was my uh, my father's sister, and my grandparents. Um, they actually heard the mob coming down the street. Um, the house had a back door. They escaped through the back door into the neighbor's house. Now, the neighbor was actually a pro-Nazi. Uh, I'll explain the political situation a bit later. He was actually a pro-Nazi, but uh, his wife, to use my aunt's uh, word, was a lady. And she welcomed uh, my aunt and my grandparents into their house. And she said, you can stay here as long as you like. And she even made, made the beds for them. And they stayed a few days until the, the trouble had died down. Um, then the Nazi, actually, he was quite a, a, a sort of chivalrous fellow. He saw that the looters had entered my grandparents' house and they were leaving with everything that they could find, all the furniture, everything. And he said to them, if you don't put everything back, into that house, I will, I will shoot you, basically. And this is what they did. They put everything back in the house. Uh, and so uh, my grandparents, uh, you know, did not lose anything. Wow. So, so that's the personal story. Uh, to bring it up to date, um, it was not unusual for these riots to break out in the Arab world. Um, it I just want to give people context, yeah. Lynn, before yeah. you continue. We're talking about 1941. There mm. was no state of Israel. Mm -hmm. They were not rioting because of a state of Israel or, uh, or, or the Jews in Israel doing anything to Arabs. Mm -hmm. It's 1941. So I just want to give that context for people. So please continue. Yeah. So to go back to 1941, there'd been a rise in uh, anti-Jewish sent sentiment. In fact, there was a rise in pro-Nazi sympathy in the 1930s in Iraq. And there was a great deal of uh, nationalism in Iraq. 
uh, when Hitler came to power and Mussolini came to power, um, many Iraqis sympathized with uh, fascism and Nazism. Uh, in fact, there was a club that was established called the Mutana Club, which was a nationalist club. And uh, many of the members of that club became the ringleaders of, of the Farhud. Uh, there was also a, um, a great desire to get rid of British influence in Iraq, because uh, Iraq had been under British mandate until independence in 1932, but was still in the British sphere of influence. Uh, the Jews were identified with the British. They were identified as collaborators with the British. And what mm. happened was after the Arab revolt in Palestine, um, in 1939, the Mufti of Jerusalem actually arrived in Baghdad, and he had an entourage of 400 Syrians and Palestinians with him, and he immediately set about inciting violence against the local Jews. And at the same time, he tried to overthrow the pro-British government in Iraq. And finally, he and a group of uh, pro-Nazi uh, military officers um, and, and nationalist politicians, there was uh, a man called Rashid Ali who uh, headed this group. They finally overthrew the pro-British government in April 1941. They declared war against the British. The British, British fearing for their oil uh, in Iraq, uh, immediately invaded Iraq. They fought the Iraqis in what was called the 30 Days War. They defeated the pro-Nazi government and put the Mufti and his acolytes to flight. But the stage had already been set through incitement uh, through propaganda, through uh, Nazi propaganda, uh, for a terrible massacre, which is exactly what occurred on the 1st and 2nd of June 1941. So that's really the background. Um, how can we compare it to events today? Well, uh, as I was saying, it was not unusual for riots to break out in the Arab world. Um, I would say particularly in North Africa, where Jews were confined to ghettos um, for their own protection from about the 15th century onwards. And these raids into wow. the ghetto were usually really for loot uh, in order to strip the Jews of their possessions. And also uh, abductions were very common too of Jewish women. Um, and that's something which isn't spoken about. And um, my own feeling is that these raids into the Jewish quarters occurred so frequently that they weren't even recorded. So it's not true to say that there was peaceful coexistence between Jews and Muslims. There was uh, a, a form of protection given to the Jews. It was as in, as in medieval Europe, you know, under the feudal system. Jews uh, were, came under the protection of the ruler of the day. They paid a special tax for that. Uh, but the mob sometimes could not be controlled. And because they were mostly illiterate, they could be easily swayed. And I think today, obviously, the level of education is much higher uh, yeah. in the Arab world. But um, the means of, of influencing young people is now through social media. And of course, social media amplifies all the lies and the smears and the misinformation about Israel and Jews. So I think that is a big element um, that has that perhaps explains some of the trouble that uh, has has broken out in Israel. I'd love to hear your feedback upon this because. Um... And, and we discussed this a little before before we started the interview. In a lot of the research that I've done over the years, um, I've come to understand I've come to understand that there is a difference between the relationship that a Jew can have with an with an individual mm -hmm. Arab Muslim neighbor and the mob culture. 
-hmm. within the Arab Muslim world that sometimes even overtakes the individual friendship a particular Arab Muslim might have with an individual Jew or a Jewish family. Now, first of all, um, am I right in, in, in coming up with that differentiation based on your based on your understanding? And how hard is that then? To, oh, let, let, just why don't yeah. you answer that? What do you uh, think? Yeah, well, I think, yes, you probably can distinguish between the individual and the mob. And there's something about being part of a mob that really creates a, a, a certain pattern, pattern of behavior. Um, in the Farhud, many Muslims did save Jews, uh, it is true. Um, and if they hadn't, obviously the death toll would have been much, much higher. Uh, but it's also true uh, that familiarity did not necessarily breed um, sympathy. So Jews found themselves attacked by neighbors. They found themselves attacked by the local butcher or the local policeman even, because some of the police sided uh, with the rioters. Um, so you're right that uh, a Muslim, there is a kind of code of honor in a way when, when uh, you know, certain Muslims felt that they had to protect uh, their Jewish neighbors and they did, but others did not. So you had both sides, you had both sides. You had it in Hebron where the death toll in 1929 would have been a lot higher had Muslims not protected Jews. Uh, on the other hand, you had uh, an incident near Jerusalem. I've forgotten the name of the uh, the place um, where uh, a doctor treated Arab patients, a Jewish doctor, um, and uh, they they turned against him and they killed him. You know, so it's it, it really was completely arbitrary what happened. I think it points to the fact that the Jews actually could not rely on the forces of law and order to protect them. And ultimately, uh, this is why um, most of the Jewish community of, of Iraq, in fact, in other countries as well, um, feared a second, a second Fahud um, when Israel was established and there was trouble, there was violence. Uh, given the choice, they decided to leave. Yeah, it, it's just following what you were saying. I mean, the two stories, the dichotomy that I, I, must, uh, I mentioned this earlier, a student of uh, also the, 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 the Arab Muslim massacre of the Jewish community of Hebron and the, mm -hmm. and the massacres of 1929 ac across the cities in the land of Israel. And there are two stories that stick out in my mind from a survivor um, and he said, on the one hand, his life was saved because he and whatever friends he was with, he was a, he was a teenager at the time, a, a yeshiva student, an American yeshiva student studying in, in Hebron yeshiva at the time. And he and a few of the other students uh, uh, snuck into an Arab house with a family. And once the Arab family realized they were in the house... Well, yeah. when the mob came to their door and like were banging on the door to hand over the Jews who were hiding there, they stood up to their Arab neighbors and said, no, they are in our house and we have to protect them. So that's yeah. part of the honor code within society. But the other story that he tells is of the is of the, 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 the baker of Hebron, a Jewish, a Jewish baker who for years had a very loyal and close mm -hmm. Arab Muslim employee. They used to go to each other's... Uh, family events and go to each other's homes. And yet yeah. on the day of that massacre, that his own employee not only killed the boss, the Jewish baker, he severed his head and put his head in the oven, which I don't yeah. know like what other sign of internal hatred one can show, even though through the decades, they were essentially so close. So mm -hmm. this shows the dichotomy and the complexity within the relationship that mm -hmm. I think what I believe is, is a huge challenge for many Jews today, especially so, so ingrained within Western culture that this is so anathema to, 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 to our culture, to even, to even consider, wait a second, how, how, I can't even go there. I can't think of that. So again, based on your knowledge, what, what are important uh, concepts or lessons for whether Israelis or non-Israeli Jews today to internalize from 
history, going back hundreds of years, but even just back to 1940, 1929, 1941, and what we just witnessed today to better internalize how best to move forward with a realistic perspective of living uh, together with, mm -hmm. with, with with Arab Muslims, both individually and on a, a on a communal level. Yeah, um, I think there are two aspects to this. One is the level of hatred, which, which is inciting uh, people to behave in this way. We need to do something to mitigate this. I'm not sure how we can, um, but you know we can try uh, as much as possible. I mean, social media is a double-edged sword. It can be used to amplify the hate, but we could also, in theory, use it to um, push back against the hate and, and to promote the truth. The other aspect is um, the difference between the situation in the Arab countries and the situation in Israel now and the situation in Europe is the forces of law and order really are there to protect uh, the Jewish minority. And, um, you know, this is what we, we have to rely on them to do their job. I think where there were uh, really bad riots and where the Farhud broke out is because um, there was a vacuum, um, you know, and, and the forces of law, law and order did not do their job. And in the Iraqi case, a lot of policemen joined the rioters. So where you have a situation like that, uh, the only person you can turn to really is, is uh, your neighbor in the hope that your neighbor will protect you. Uh, so, you know, I, I think we're not quite in the same situation. Obviously, the, the, it's very important for the forces of law and order in Israel to actually do their job and not be intimidated in any way, um, you know, by violence and by threats. Uh, because once you do that, then, you know, all hell could be let loose. You know, you, know, you, and, make, and, a very, you make a very important point, yeah. but I think, I don't know if, uh, how much you've been following the news, just of the, the, the amount of anti-Semitic attacks in the name of this hatred towards Jews from, from Arab Muslims who are supporters of Palestine, but just two accounts, like you just mentioned, um, uh, uh, going back to the Farhud, the guy who escaped the bus, that they were pulling the Jews off the bus, are you a Jew, are you a Jew? And then and then beating them up or, maybe, or doing whatever to them. Just now in Los Angeles, just wow. now in Los Angeles, there were Arab Muslims driving the streets and they stopped at a, a, in front of a restaurant where Jews were sitting and they were asking, who's a Jew, who's a Jew? And then started beating up Jews. So yeah. I, I don't know whether they were arrested or not, no clue, but it's just scary to think that something like that. And again, when you're going to the mob mentality and when law and order is not 100% there, because we're all familiar with the political correctness that is sweeping through many communities in America where the police are not doing their jobs. So all of a sudden, a lot of Jews are, are scared. Wait a second, mm -hmm. what's going on? Can it be me sitting at a restaurant outside all of a sudden attacked by a bunch of people just driving by because they hate Jews? because of this mob mentality within their culture. And the yes. other event that just happened yesterday was in New York City. It actually was two, I don't know, two Israelis who actually served in the IDF, so they actually fought back, but they were attacked by, again, another Arab Muslim mob in the name of Palestine, but they fought back. So guess mm -hmm. who was arrested, though? They yeah. arrested the Jews. Yeah. They didn't yeah. arrest the, 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 the Muslim mob. So... Yeah. Well, can so I add that? Point that is so uh, important. Can I add that, that? Yeah, that that uh, it happened in England. Um, there was a whole convoy of cars draped in Palestinian flags, and uh, they had a loud hailer and they were shouting, "F the Jews, rape Jewish their Jewish daughters," and this actually shocked the ordinary non non Jewish. Brit, and it was actually news headlines on the BBC and stuff. I think it did shake people that that you know that such a thing could happen on the streets uh, of 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 Britain. Um, so it's it's a kind of international phenomenon. This this sort of anti-Jewish incitement, um, and and I saw that clip of the restaurant in Los Angeles, and the, the man was actually wielding a, a guy he was he, he had a piece of furniture and he was going to 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 sort of 
throw it at, at the, the Jew, wasn't he? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, this is very, very scary. Um, I think the police are sometimes intimidated. You know, we know of several incidents where, where it's an open and shut case, the Jew was attacked, and yet the police it didn't come to court or, or the uh, attacker was was let off um, or he wasn't he, he wasn't uh, arrested um, you know and this this has happened in the past and this is a very worrying situation because Jews will now feel that they're not properly protected right right yeah no so again so your point about law and order is is so important and it's such an important clarification and yet it is a worry with with how we see things developing today. Like, is law and order in the different countries actually going to enforce law and order to stop it in time so innocent Jews are not are, are not affected? All right. So you know, what? I want to I want to then jump to uh, to your book. What yeah. made you write this book? Three thousand years of Jewish life, and again, for people to understand, specifically Iraq. Iraq is one of the oldest Jewish communities outside the land of Israel from the Jews who were exiled from the land of Israel back in biblical times, like mm -hmm. the oldest Jewish community outside the land of Israel and yet non-existent going mm -hmm. back to the 1940s. And, uh, and, and, and most 99% of the Jewish population in the Arab Muslim world is no longer. I, I'm sure you're familiar with the famous video clip of Hillel Neuer, who's United Nations Watch yeah, yeah, in yeah. the United Nations when they're bashing Israel and bashing Israel and bashing Israel. And, and he goes, he goes, Tunisia, where are you Jews? Egypt, yeah. where are you Jews? Iraq, yeah. where are you Jews? Meaning the world is it has ignored the anti-Semitism that has has pushed away all the Jews who had to run away from the Arab world. So yeah. what what made you write the book? Well, partly my own family background, and the other reason was, of course, this massive uh, ignorance of, uh, about the subject. Because I, I think to understand the Arab-Israeli conflict, you really need to understand uh, what happened to the Jews in the Arab and Muslim world. And that was ethnic cleansing. So uh, if you look at Israel as the last bastion of uh, Jewish life in the Middle East, and it is under threat. It is under threat from these totalitarian fascist movements like Hamas and, and Hezbollah who actually want to finish off the job of ethnic cleansing. It changes your perspective. You know, uh, it gives a wider context uh, to, the whole, uh, to the whole problem. And this is what I've, I've tried to do, um, to show that Jews are a Middle Eastern people they have very deep roots. As you say, uh, the Iraqi diaspora or the Babylonian diaspora goes back uh, to the 6th century before the Christian era. Um, and we were there before the Arabs, um, before the Muslims, a thousand years before then. And yet we are the ones being smeared as, as settler colonialists. You know, so on many levels, uh, the whole issue of Jews from Arab countries is so is so central uh, to the whole conflict, you know. And, and I think one of the main reasons why I wrote it was really to explode this myth of peaceful coexistence, because it it wasn't peaceful coexistence. There were sp sporadic outbreaks of violence, and Jews were never considered equal to Muslims up until the uh, colonial era and that was the first time really that Jews got equal rights and in fact it was a, a golden age for them the early 20th century where Jews did thrive and contributed massively to their societies but of course that came to an end with the rise of um, Arab nationalism and uh, the rise of Islamism and we're seeing the consequences today, you know, in, in, uh, in the shape of all these Islamist parties who are trying to wreak havoc uh, across the world. So basically, right. that's it. <laughs> right. No, and, no and, what, and, and your explanation, I think it's so important. You just made a clarification that in order to understand the conflict between Israel and the Arab Muslim world today, 
you have to understand the greater history of Jews in the Middle East for thousands of years. Too many people think this conflict is about 1967, about 1948, and they totally ignore the historic conflict between the Arab Muslim world and the Jews in the Arab Muslim world in the Middle East. Um, and, I, and that's an explanation for why in Israel on a political level, on a percentage level, there are so many more Middle Eastern Jews who are what's called right wing on a security oh. level, as opposed to European Jews who, ju who are unfamiliar with that context and that history. And they just come from the perspective of escaping Europe from the Holocaust to come to our Jewish homeland. And they feel guilty of, whoa, the poor Arabs, what we've done to them because we've created our homeland. And they totally ignore the thousands of year history that you're, 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 you're referring to that is so important to understand the greater context of the conflict. Um, yeah. So thank, thank you, you so much for, for assisting with that. It's, it's a pleasure. No, I think uh, you're absolutely right. You'll find very few Mizrahi Jews actually on the left, um, you know, in, in these, I mean, the interfaith initiatives, coexistence initiatives, it's all well and good, uh, but you find that they all break down at a time of increased tension like we have now. Uh, you know, and uh, certainly the initiatives we have here, my husband's involved in, in one initiative which brings together Christians and Muslims and, and he, he's the only Jew. And then suddenly they're all fired up uh, about what's happening in Israel. They want to go on demonstrations and, and all. And these are people who are meant to be active in interfaith and coexistence. Uh, so, you know, it's all very well to have a superficial, you know, understanding and say, you know, well, we get on, we, we break bread together and all that. But I think true understanding lies in airing the points of division between people, not just, you know, the commonality, if you like, the points of connection. No, 100%. I mean, I, 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 a line that I like to use, I'm a big believer that we, we will have peaceful coexistence moving forward. In the, it is possible, but it is impossible until we, the Jewish community, internalize the reality of our existence in the Arab Muslim Middle East and that context and understanding of that culture. So long as we talk ourselves into that we don't need to understand that and we ignore it and just go according to the, oh, the interfaith, let's just work on the on the coexistence, mm -hmm. then it's not going to happen. We're, we're just pushing off the inevitable continuation of violence. Uh, yeah. So it's so critical to understand uh, the, the truth and the history and the context. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Lynn, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much. I can't wait to get my hands on your book so I can read it myself. Just to put everything, I didn't even know Lynn was an author of a book before I before I started this interview. I, it was about, we were going to speak about the Farhud and all the context, but I did not know that she is an author. And I definitely want to get my hands on that book so I can uh, learn more as well. So anyone interested in that book, where do they, where do they purchase it? So it is on Amazon. And uh, if you can be patient and wait till uh, we get to Israel in July, we will be bringing some uh, stock for um, the bookshop in Jerusalem. What's it called? Pomerantz? <laughs> Pomerantz, exactly. Yeah, they, they, they actually sold their stock um, some time ago. So we will be restocking Pomerantz. Wonderful. So I, I will wait. I'll, I'll wait to be able to get a signed copy if you'd give me one and take a nice sure. selfie with you sure, in sure. Jerusalem. <laughs> Wonderful. And then for everyone else in Jerusalem, it will be available in Pomeran starting in January, J July, you said? July, July. In yes, July. Yes, okay, wonderful. Okay. Uh, so Lynn, thank you so much. Stay safe, stay That's healthy that. with your family Bye. and looking forward to seeing you in Jerusalem. Thank you very much, Abby. It's a thank pleasure. You. Everybody, I hope you very much uh, enjoyed learning, right? There was so much to, to take in, to internalize from uh, the information that Lynn just gave over to us. And again, it's not just about learning history. It's in order to understand the correct context of what is happening today. It's all nice and well for everyone who wants peace and just wants peace and for us to live peacefully together. 
Peace can only be possible if we understand correctly the context and the region that we live in. And those are pieces of the puzzle that Lynn has dedicated much of her life to helping all of us internalize. And it is so, so critical. So uh, please share this video for everyone to be able to watch and learn and be enriched so that we can move forward to a better future, not a better future, um, uh, ignoring reality and the context, but a better future based on understanding and internalizing reality and our context. So signing off for another episode of the Pulse of Israel here in our eternal and undivided capital, Jerusalem. Thanks for watching. And if you are not yet a subscriber for the Pulse of Israel, please go visit our website, pulseofisrael.com and subscribe to our newsletter so you will not miss any of our videos or interviews to help you get a better understanding and context that unfortunately is usually ignored by most of the media, including Jewish Israeli media today. Shalom everyone, thanks for watching. Pulse of Israel, frontline videos from the Holy Land. Support our work by donating today.